the question posed to our blessed Lord and Savior by the Pharisees, in which they asked, our, asked him when the kingdom of God would come, is a question about, about fulfillment. The Jews anticipated the restoration of the kingdom and hoped, as the Pharisees did, that the Romans would be driven out and they would become a free and mighty nation once again. But our Lord's answer to the question goes well beyond any kind of um, restoration in this world. Our Lord is answering about final things, about the final question of our eternal destiny. And so he had to begin by correcting their idea that this would be some temporal kingdom, some grandiose um, defeat of the Romans and of all the enemies of the Jews. And so he says the kingdom of God cannot be observed. And in the Greek, the, the word that means cannot be observed there, actually more accurately translate, translated is without outward show. It's not going to be spectacular. It's not going to be something that uh, is put down in the history books. Of course, we know in the end, the last judgment, the coming of our Lord at the end of time will be something, um, you know, it'll be the real end. Um, but our Lord goes on to say that for behold, the kingdom of a God is among you, some translations say within you, because it's here and now Theologians say we live in the already and not yet. The kingdom of God is already among us. We're already experiencing the final things. We already have the promise of eternity. And yet on the other hand, we, we know we're still in the veil of tears and our, the mystery that we experience more often is the cross and not so much the resurrection. And so our Lord is trying to correct this error on the part of the Pharisees and encourage them to look within, to recognize the presence of the kingdom already. And, you know, this is um, our constant struggle. You know, people live in the world today as if there is no kingdom, as if there will be no end, no consequences. It's Bishop Sheen used to point out that in the East under the Soviet Empire uh, that there was this theoretical atheism, you know, a militant atheism being pushed right and left. We have a bit, we have our fair share of it here in the West, but more often what we have is practical atheism. We believe in God, but we act like we don't. And this of course is what we experience throughout our culture, in the education system, in the media, everywhere we go, people behave and act as if there is no kingdom, nothing beyond this world, no consequences to our actions. Today we celebrate the feast of Saint Nicholas Tavalek and his companion martyrs, three martyrs, Nicholas, Peter, and Stephen, and their story is very similar to the stories of many other friars, Franciscan friars, who went to preach the gospel in the Holy Land, like St. Berard and Companions, and St. Daniel and Companions, and there are many others. They, they went to the Holy Land with every expectation of dying a martyr and every desire to die a martyr. They went there to preach the gospel and to give their lives for Christ. And they got their example, of course, from St. Francis, who attempted to make it to the Holy Land, I think, on three occasions, and only made it on his third, third try. And his goal was to die a martyr in, in Egypt, and, and that didn't happen. He tried to convert the, uh, the emir there, and, and uh, the, he, the, this man was so enamored with St. Francis that he he was very uh, impressed and, and, uh, and he didn't convert, but he didn't want to kill St. Francis either. 
uh, the story goes that in, in the end he did convert, but he did so later in life because he was afraid of losing his life as, as he would have if he had converted openly. But after the example of St. Francis, many of the early Franciscans went to the Holy Land in view of the kingdom, realizing that the presence of Christ is, was already with them and that they wanted to give this presence, this kingdom to, to everyone, to preach it, the coming of Christ and, and that the ultimate uh, uh, judgment will be dependent upon whether we accept him or not. With every expectation, as I said, that they would, um, that they would suffer martyrdom. If we think about the, the martyrs and their motivations, what led them to this, this kind of behavior, what gave them strength and courage to, to do this seemingly without fear. You know, in fact, uh, Nicholas and his companions told, uh, told the Qadi, the man, the, the leader of, of the Muslims, uh, that they were not afraid. It doesn't matter what you do to us, we will not renounce our faith. We have, we have come here to tell you that the only way, way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Um, it's because they possess the kingdom. It's because they possess Christ within them. It's because they had his grace and they treasured that above all things. You know, so we have to recognize the kingdom in the world in which we live. We'd all, always like to find things to be different than they are, better than they are, holier than they are around people that were more cooperative and, and um, accepting of, of God's, uh, God's favor and, and of his mercy, but we live in the circumstances in which we live and we must find the kingdom of God there. Um, and be willing to choose Christ above all things and to, to uh, suffer whatever it is God sends us uh, in order to be faithful to him. In the Book of Wisdom, we, we hear about wisdom. She's personified as, as a woman, you know, fairer than the sun that su who surpasses every constellation compared to light, she takes precedence. For that, in, for that indeed night supplants, but wickedness prevails not over wisdom. Wisdom will always prevail. She is always pure and holy and resplendent. And the wisdom that God gives us is um, is the wisdom to put love over everything else. We're able to assess everything around us by the charity of Christ and recognize uh, that everything that we've been given, our purpose for being here is about loving our Lord and not counting the cost. Um, sacred scripture here in wisdom is used by Holy Mother Church to also personify the Blessed Mother uh, because you know, all these words uh, apply to her, as we know, for she is an aura of the might of God and a pure effusion of the glory of the Almighty, for not, for not, therefore not that is sullied enters into her. These are all applied to Our Lady because she is truly wise. She chooses God above all things. She chooses the kingdom that's been given to her before anything else. And she is free, uh, immaculately free from all sin. May we have then the wisdom of the martyrs so that we recognize that the kingdom of God is within us and that it can't be taken from us except by our own willing to be to, uh, separated from the Lord through sin. God's wisdom is his power and he sends his mother as our protector uh, to help us be like Saint Nicholas and companions, be willing to give everything out of love for Christ, recognizing that his kingdom is with us and is coming and we will see him face to face in heaven for all eternity.